You have my word that no humanities, literature, or classics professor gave me any money to say what I'm about to say. I believe one of the greatest books ever written is The Odyssey by Homer, and The Iliad, also by Homer, and The Aeneid by Virgil. I would put these right up there with the works of Shakespeare, the Bible, Don Quixote, as far as having a cultural and literary significance in our world. Okay, that's enough of an intro. To get on with it, Odysseus is leaving Troy. The battle has been gone over for 10 years, and he is trying to get home to his beloved Penelope. It's one of the greatest longing love stories that we have. And he's sailing on his mighty ship, all his men are around him, and all sorts of things, mythical and governmental, and all these things are attacking him, trying to keep him from getting home to his bride. And one of the things, you probably have heard of this from culture or seen it in art, is the sirens, the sirens call. He is warned of all the things that are going to happen to him and are going to be trying to stop. And he was instructed that there are these three beautiful women. Well, they appear as beautiful women. They're actually scaly, winged, ugly things. But they appear to be beautiful women standing on a rock, and they sing a beautiful song, sweetly calling all ships over to their rocks so that they can crash and die. Odysseus was told that you need to ball up uh, beeswax and stuff it in your companion's ears so that they do not hear it. But he said, what about me? I want to hear it. I want to hear how great that song is. So then he was instructed, have your companions tie you to the mast from your head to your foot so that you don't run towards it, so that you don't scream. However much you protest, don't let them turn around. So that's exactly what happened. A reading from the 12th book of Homer. The swift ship, as it drew nearer, was seen by the sirens, and they directed their sweet song toward us. Come this way, honored Odysseus, great glory of the Achaeans, and stay your ship so that you can listen here to our singing. For no one else has ever sailed past this place in his black ship until he has listened to the honey-sweet voices that issues from our lips, and then goes on, well-pleased, knowing more than ever he did. For we know everything that the Argives and the Trojans did and suffered in wide Troy through the gods' despite. Over all the generous earth, we know everything that happens. The word of Homer. (laughs) So we have here a very strong man traveling through an ocean on his ship. And then paired, we have another literary figure today. He has no ship. He has no crew. He has no beeswax, no straps and mast. Jesus is going alone through the desert. No water, no food, probably no even shoes. And these are contrasted because they're both traveling through temptations, calling to us. He is not dealing with beautiful women, but instead he is dealing with Satan, the Lord of darkness and the Prince of Lies himself. Bodily pleasures are things that he promises. And yes, he only says a, a loaf of bread being changed from a rock, and that probably wouldn't taste too good anyway. But the point is that these are pleasures of the flesh that Jesus is being tempted with. Anything that makes us feel good in life, the Satan is saying, you can have these. Honor and wealth are other things he tempts him with. He takes him to the top and looks at all the Palestinian first century kingdoms and palaces and wealth that he could have. That doesn't sound too attractive to us because I really wouldn't want to be in that time. But for us, that translates to anytime you have control in your life, anytime people look up to you, for guidance, for protection. You have power and you have wealth and you have honor. A few times I've experienced that just briefly as I've been, uh, you know, that one guy in your friend group who gets to decide everything. I make a joke and they laugh. We get to go see what movie I want. We get to go to whatever restaurant I want. We get to do whatever I want and everyone follows me. It's kind of like what having a little brother's like too for a couple of years. 
There's all sorts of different places in the workplace where we can seek and we are given honor and wealth. And all we have to do is just reach out and take it. And then finally, power. Hurling yourself down off a temple to your death does not sound like power, but Satan is tempting Jesus with power over God. Basically, we have control over God because he promised us that, well, his angels are going to catch you lest you dash your foot on a stone. So, why not just hurl yourself over and see if he actually will do that? If he does, you have complete control over God. Bodily pleasures, honor and wealth, and power over God himself are these three things that Satan is tempting Jesus with and tempting us with. But what's his response? His response is no. A defiant and resounding no. He responds with scripture, which is himself. He is the living scripture. He responds and says, nope, God is my satisfaction. God himself is my fulfillment. He is all I need. How nice would it be, let's say you gave up chocolate for Lent, how nice would it be if you had a team of friends that tied you up and put you in the shopping cart and tied you up so that while you were there wheeling you down the candy aisle, they would just kept moving forward. They would not let you stop and grab that candy off the shelf. Or how nice would it be if you gave up, you know, watching three or four or seven or twelve YouTube videos, one right after the other. How nice would it be as if you're sitting there at your computer and a few people came and slapped your hand away and said, go read a book. We don't have that. We have, we are like Jesus. We have us, our conscience, and the Holy Spirit guiding us past all these sirens on all these rocks, telling us to come on over, crash your ship, see what we know. Odysseus has promised knowledge. He's promised that you'll know everything there is to know if you just come and listen to us. And he wants it. We desire things. That's part of what is being human. And our desires go to chocolate, YouTube videos, insert whatever other thing that you want. But what we do during this Lenten season is we say no. We say, yes, chocolate's good. So is, you know beer, so staying up late, so is reading too much, so is anything that we give up for Lent, we, those things are good, but we say that heaven is better. The bodily pleasure that chocolate gives me, that's going to be ten times fulfilled in heaven. The excitement that I get when I get to control and tell people what to do, we are going to be kings and queens in heaven. And finally, the power over God is already given to us. We don't have to wait till heaven. All we have to do is approach this altar. Say, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and I shall be healed. He gives us himself. He makes himself into a tiny piece of bread. Few drops of wine. We get to eat and drink his body and blood. That is having power over God that he gives directly to us. So as we go into Lent, as we go into this new season, reminding ourselves that it is better to say no, because there'll be an even greater reward and an even greater yes later. Let's keep in mind that we do not do this alone. We do it as a community. We do it with Jesus and the Holy Spirit on our way to our eternal reward. Amen.